Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me make sure, can everybody understand me okay? okay. Well, first of all, um, let me start with this slide. Um, thanks so much for, uh, for showing up tonight. This is it's great to have such a, a wonderful turnout. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize the Idaho Fishing Game and, and the Nature Conservancy for organizing this event and inviting me for this, uh, for this opening uh, presentation. And thanks, Curtis and Steve, for the, for the introduction. I'll get um, right into it. Um, what I try to cover tonight is um, a lot of the, the more recent information, the more recent research that we've been working on. But we'll go back into history a little bit and, and look at uh, how we, we got to where we are now with, with the Yellowstone grizzly bear uh, population. And it's really been a, an, an interesting journey of uh, scientific discovery. Now, you, as soon as you uh, hear me talk, of course, you, you hear that, uh, that I'm not from around here. And that's true. Uh, as Curtis said, I, uh, um, I got my degree in the Netherlands, and that's also where, uh, where I grew up. And uh, I, I'm usually not the type of person that talks a lot about um, himself, but there is a reason that I, that I mentioned this. So I grew up uh, with, uh, with windmills and, and bikes and good beer and, and skating on the canals. And what I also grew up with was a landscape that, in a way, was empty. And what I mean with that is that, as a, as a kid growing up, I was, I was really interested in biology. But one thing we didn't have was large predators. The largest predator we had was the red fox. Well, that, that doesn't quite compare to a grizzly bear. <laughs> so it was something that I was always, um, in a way, missing and longing for. So when I had an opportunity, to do, um, as part of my master's degree, to do an internship at the University of Tennessee with a professor uh, in, that uh, was well known for his black bear work at the time, Dr. Mike Pelton. Uh, I took uh, advantage of that opportunity and, and jumped the puddle, so to speak, and spent the next 23 years working on, on various black bear projects in, in the southeast. And that's, uh, that was an incredible experience also um, yeah, we, we did a lot of field work in Great Smoky Mountains National Park and other uh, parts of the southeast. And uh, just, to in, just to show you how different things are down there with those um, uh, big trees, this is where, where black bears den, way up in big hollow trees, sometimes 100 feet up in a tree. And uh, they'll stay in a hollow tree like that for six months or so. Uh, pretty incredible. But I was looking, uh, looking out west all the time, and um, I got an opportunity um, to join the interagency grizzly bear study team a number of years ago here, and and it's been a real privilege to to be working here in, in this ecosystem because, as you can see, this is not an empty ecosystem. We have the the full suite of of large predators in this ecosystem, and it's and it's an incredible experience to to be hiking around and to recreate in these areas. Um, as, as most of you probably do and, and know, it is uh, somewhat of a humbling experience, um, knowing that there's predators out there that are way more powerful than you are. And it's, uh, it's a, to me, that is almost invigorating. There's something about hiking in this landscape that you cannot get in many other places. I'll start, I'll talk a little bit about some, some general biology. Um, so let's first look at, at the global uh, brown bear, grizzly bear range. And what you see here is the range in, in, the, in the red color. So in, in North America, you know, we're primarily talking, of course, about uh, Alaska and Canada. Uh, combined, there's, there's roughly about um, 55,000 um, brown grizzly bears in, in North America. Then Russia really has the, the most uh, brown bears. It's, probably somewhere around 100,000. And then there's various uh, status for populations in, in, uh, in southern uh, in Europe and, uh, and, and the Middle East. Uh, Scandinavian population is doing pretty well. And then we have some pretty reasonable populations still in the Tibetan Plateau. So these are rough estimates, but roughly uh, in the, the population uh, in, the, in the entire world is about 200,000. So other than black bears, this is the next species that is doing uh, relatively well among the eight bear species in the world. Then let's start look a little bit closer at, uh, at North America. And uh, what you see here in light green is the of uh, grizzly bears. 
in North America. And in dark green is the current range, pretty, pretty rough estimate there. But um, basically about in the lower 48s, we're talking about, at about 2% uh, of the range still. So we've seen a drastic reduction in range, and, and a lot of that has occurred over the last uh, 100, 200 years. Then focusing further in on, on the lower 48s, um, we have six um, grizzly bear recovery areas, recovery zones that are designated by the, the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, of which only five actually have grizzly bears. Um, Yellowstone, where we'll focus on next, is the most southern population, and we have uh, also the Northern Continental Divide population with about a thousand individuals. I'll talk a little bit more about population size on the, the Yellowstone population uh, a little bit later. Cabinet Jack ecosystem has roughly about 45 grizzly bears. The South Kirks, including the, the, the Canadian portion of that, has about 80. And then the North Cascades, really pretty uncertain what the status is of that population. Um, it's probably less than, than a dozen, maybe even fewer than that. The Bitterroots uh, do not have any confirmed uh, population of, of grizzly bears. Uh, there was a record uh, back in uh, 2007, um, fairly close to, to this recovery area uh, of, a, of a male that actually came from the Cabinet Jack ecosystem. In terms of the, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem where we are here, um, Yellowstone National Park, of course, has been at the center of, uh, of recovery. And Yellowstone has a, has a pretty unique history when it comes to bear management. Um, almost by default, it, it kind of became the, the leader in, in advancing bear management over time. You know, so we, we went from a, a situations like this where, bears, uh, where people were literally watching bears at the, what they called the, the lunch counter, uh, which was for bears only, like that needed to be specified. And in 1910, we had the first incidents of, of bear panhandling, uh, black bears in this case. But um, those became pretty common features of, of many national parks, uh, including Yellowstone National Park, of course. And bears got pretty smart. So some learned to drive, even though uh, they didn't quite know which side of the road they needed to be on. But but this was a, a period where there was a lot of uh, uncertainty and controversy about uh, the, the greater Yellowstone uh, population and Yellowstone National Park particularly, uh, because the concern was really uh, with regard to these open pit garbage dumps where bears were openly feeding. Uh, it was basically a visitor attraction. And during the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s, there were several reports produced uh, within the park service that uh, the, the one famous one is the Leopold Report that really suggested that the Park Service should develop a more natural management of, of wildlife and particularly bears. So the switch was made um, to, for the Park Service to move from these open pit garbage dumps where bears have at, had access to garbage to, to closing those off. There was a big controversy, big debate at the time whether that should be done instantaneously or whether it should be phased in and be done gradually. At the time, the, the Park Service made the decision to do that instantaneously, and that led to a lot of mortality. About in a, in a matter of a fairly short time period, in the late 60s, early 70s, about 229 grizzly bears died because of management actions, because they were, once the, the dumps closed, they were getting into trouble. They were getting into trouble looking for food. So we were actually getting into um, a situation where we were literally, people were getting worried about the population, whether it would actually be able to sustain itself with that level of mortality at the time when you know, there was no reliable population estimate at the time, but it, um, you know, 229 out of a couple of hundred individuals, people started to really get concerned about that. And that is the reason that um, the, the populations in the lower 48s were listed in 1975 as threatened under the, the U.S. Endangered Species Act, which, uh, which was a, a new act that had just been established in 1973. Two years prior to that, in 1973, those same controversies also led to the establishment of the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team. 
And the thought behind that was, was that there was a real desire to have an independent research team, not just researchers from the National Park Service, for example, or any other agency, but have um, research from various agencies work together independently and produce science with which managers could make better decisions. So uh, you see the, the, the logos here of the, the eight agencies that are member agencies of the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team. Um, I'm with the U.S. Geological Survey. We have several other federal agencies, the National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, the uh, U.S. Forest Service, and then of course the, the state agencies, uh, Wyoming uh, Game and Fish Department, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, and Idaho uh, Fish and Game. And then we have uh, Wind River uh, Tribal Agencies that are part of our team as well. So the idea behind that was really for the interagency grizzly bear study team to, to do the science. Um, some of that science uh, was based on, on tasks that we get from the managers. If managers are looking for a particular uh, research question that would help their management, um, uh, we are then tasked to, to address that in our research. And sometimes we, we develop our own uh, research questions as well in, in terms of what we think are, are important factors to look at. Our research findings are then um, fed into uh, an, a group called the Interagency Grizzly Bear Committee. That's kind of the policy arm of the same agencies that are member agencies on our study team. Um, but they have the capability to change things on the ground because these are the same, the, the same people that, uh, the same agencies, high level uh, people that, that, that sit on this committee are also able to actually affect management on the ground. And that, I think, is this, this is a pretty unique construct. There's not many examples I can think of where this was des by design set up this way. And it's made a huge difference, in th I think, in terms of recovery for this population because by the ability of, of changing things on the ground really uh, is the key component here. So what, are the, what were the, the main factors of, this, of the recovery program? One important factor was to reduce adult female uh, mortality. That was one of the driving factors for the population declining to begin with and for the population uh, well into the 80s actually not being able to, to, get, you know, to, to start growing again. Part of that was to um, develop habitat standards with which the, the Forest Service, the Park Service and other land managers um, could improve adult female survival. Um, because motorized access we know is, is pretty well um, associated with, with higher mortality. We see that in, in just about any bear population in the world. Responsive conflict management, as, as Curtis mentioned, uh, was, was an important component of this and I think um, both the, the, the three states and the, the, the Park Service have done a really effective job of, of being responsive to conflict management, uh, which is, is a key part of all this. And of course, information and education. Um, with so many new people moving into this area, and with a lot of tourism, um, it's important that, that there is a very active effort in that. And, and Greg Lozinski with Idaho Fish and Game does a, a lot of that work. And then finally, research and monitoring. That's where we come in as the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team um, to keep things science-based and, and help managers to make decisions that are science-based. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the science aspect now. And, um, and I, I, I can't do that without first recognizing the incredible uh, contributions that the, the Craighead brothers, uh, John and Frank Craighead, made in the, in the 50s and, and 60s. They were really wildlife pioneers, not just bear research pioneers, but wildlife research pioneers. They were the, the first ones to start using radio telemetry. Um, they were the first ones to start using satellite imagery to, to map habitat, for example. Um, it, the contributions that they made, uh, not in, in Yellowstone, but, but to wildlife science in, in general, uh, has really been substantial. And so we've continued, as a study team, we've continued uh, along those lines and um, you know, I summarize here kind of what our, our study team objectives are. These are pretty broad objectives. Um, we do work beyond these, these basic objectives. We, we identify important research topics and, and do uh, additional projects 
but we do some, some annual basic monitoring to really keep track of this population and make sure that we know uh, what is happening and, and uh, what, what, if there are any future concerns um, so that we can react uh, quickly in terms of uh, helping managers make decisions. Now, studying grizzly bear populations is uh, certainly has its challenges. Um, typically, grizzly bears occur at, at pretty low densities, so you don't get, um, you don't easily get large sample sizes. Um, they have a solitary lifestyle, typically, although we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later, that that's not always the case. Um, difficult to observe. They, they use the type of habitats that make it very difficult to, to get solid observations from, uh, from aerial surveys, for example. It's, it's different from uh, surveying ungulate populations, for example, that tend to be more observable and, and have more individual in, in the same area. Um, we're dealing with remote and difficult terrain, of course. And uh, the way grizzly bears are, they're, they're not quite uh, that cooperative. So uh, we, have, we have a few challenges to deal with, and that's why we, we try to look at, at more, typically at more than one technique to estimate population size and look at population trend, for example. We, we, we never rely on one single method. So now I'll walk you through some of the, the, the recent findings um, from our research, and um, some of it goes, goes back several decades, actually, in terms of the, some of the time series that we'll look at. And we'll first start looking at, at range expansion. And um, I use this, um, this slide uh, to illustrate this. Uh, this is a pretty unique observation. This is one of, one of our pilots uh, took this picture last year. This is a female with, uh, it looks like a single cub of the year. It may, she might have another cub with her there that's in her shadow that we can't see on the photo. But she is followed by a female with two yearlings, which um, is pretty unique. That th those are not the type of things that you uh, observe a lot. And it uh, made me wonder if, if these particular two individuals uh, may actually be related to each other. So let's look at, at range expansion. And before we, we do that, um, just to orient ourselves here, so uh, this uh, green boundary is the, the National Park, so Yellowstone National Park really at the core of the ecosystem and Grand Teton National Park. And then this is the actual boundary of that uh, grizzly bear recovery zone that was established in 1982. So during the 70s, most of the occupied range of grizzly bears was pretty much well within that, that recovery zone and, and quite a bit less than that actually. The recovery zone boundary was actually based on this time period in, in the 80s. Uh, it, was, it was established basically, basically on occupied range at that time. And I know some of you are looking at that hole there and wondering what's, what's going on there. Um, that is the Pitchstone Plateau, very unproductive habitat. And uh, it, at, it, at this early stage of, uh, of recovery, um, bears were really not getting into those areas uh, a lot, simply because it wasn't very productive. As you'll see, it starts to get filled in as the population starts expand, expanding. So through the 90s, um, we've got a, a range that is, that is quite a bit large already, about 33,000 square kilometers. And then from, this is based on 1990 to 2010, um, a huge expansion. And you see expansion especially on the eastern and southern portion and a little bit on, on the northern portion of the ecosystem. And then the most uh, recent data that we have, uh, just even with, with adding a couple, just a few more years to it, we've seen uh, expansion continuing. And now we have about 58,000 square kilometers of, of occupied range. Um, so there's, there's a substantial change in where bears are in this ecosystem. And of course, that, that change is driven by, by population growth. It's, it's really hard to imagine that you have that level of expansion um, with a declining population. Um, and so population growth has been a, a major factor in, in all this that, that, that goes along with, uh, with the expansion. And the way we've monitored population growth and, and the way we estimate population size is by really monitoring a, a particular component of the population. We focused a lot of our effort on females with cubs. That's um, uh, and females with cubs of the year. So it, when I when I mention the word cubs, I, I, I mean cubs that are less than one year old. 
And we get either aerial observations like this or sometimes just, just ground observations and we, we use that information uh, to develop an, an estimate of the population. And that's just one of, of several techniques that we, we use. But we focus on, uh, for, for one of the more important techniques, we focus on this cohort of the population because it's the, the, you know, the most identifiable cohort and it's also the from a reproductive standpoint, of course, an, an important uh, component of the population. We also do a lot of uh, intensive uh, work in terms of um, radio, you know, capturing and, and radio telemetry. Um, that is more invasive work. We try to limit that as, as much as we can, but the value of, of getting this information is really pretty tremendous. This is probably some of the, the best information that we get about this population. And we refer to it as known fate monitoring, is that the, the radio telemetry allows us to find out when bears die, how bears die, um, and that allows us to estimate their survival and the causes of, of mortality and such. And those provide tremendous insights that, that really have helped us understand uh, how this population has responded to changes uh, over time. So let's look at, at um, population growth over time. And uh, we, we look at the population trend here, and we, we call this a, a three-year average that kind of smooths out the, the trend of the population. So up to the early 2000s, we've seen um, pretty substantial uh, population growth of about 47% annually. And then since that time period, we've seen a little bit of a slowing of population growth. Now at about zero to two percent. There's still a little bit of growth, but it's not nearly like it was the, the two decades before. So there has been a change in this population, and we wanted to find out what was causing that change. And as we started digging into the, the details of that, we, we found out that what's really driving that slowing of population growth in the last 10, 15 years is the survival of younger bears. So let's look at um, survival from the cub stage, so when they're less than one year old, to subadult stage, uh, so when they're basically uh, two, to, two to three years old. In that early time period from 1983 to 2001, those, those, so we're looking basically at a three, decade, a three decade period. The first two decades of that period, about half of all the cubs would, would survive to the, to the subadult stage. In this last decade that we're looking at, this is data from 2002 to 2011, that has changed to only 30%. So a lot fewer younger animals make it to this stage of being a subadult, of being a, basically a, 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 what we call an independent age bear uh, of two years or older. What's interesting is once you're a subadult, your survival is pretty high. Every year your survival is about 95%. Once you're a subadult or, or adult, from that point on, it doesn't seem to change much. And that's true now for both females and males. And, and that's, that's still true. So the only thing that's really changed is the survival of cubs and yearlings to the, the subadult stage. And that's, that is lower now than it used to be. So then, of course, the, the, the question is, um, you know, what's behind that? Why is that, why is that happening? We started looking at potential density effects. What happens a lot in when populations start reaching carrying capacity and density increases is that populations kind of start to have some internal controls. Uh, just about any wildlife population um, eventually will do that. The, the population cannot grow uh, forever. The only species that can do that so far is the human species. Um, so the, the, this is something we were really interested in. And so we developed a, a index of grizzly bear density for, for the ecosystem. And what you'll see here is we'll start this sequence in 1983 and go to 2012. These are uh, cells of about 200 square kilometers that describes about the size of an, an annual uh, female home range. And these, the, the color of those cells will indicate relatively how many bears there are. This, this is a relative index. These, these numbers are not necessarily, does not necessarily mean that there's 25 to 30 bears in those darker colored cells. It's an index. 
but what's important here is that, that you'll see a change. You'll see uh, expansion, you see these cells expanding, and you'll see the cells getting darker, meaning that the densities are getting greater. So going through year by year, 1995 here, and you see things start darkening, and you see the population expanding. And by the time we get to, to 2012, you know, you've seen a tremendous change from where we started. And this is based on a lot of records, so we have a lot of confidence in this data, in these data. And you can see where we see the, the highest densities, of course, are in places like Yellowstone National Park, and that includes Lamar Valley, Hayden Valley. Those are places where we know we have high bear densities. Uh, east of the park, we have some, some good areas. Uh, Upper Green, there's also very good habitat with, with lots of bears. So we started looking at that, at that information of, of density and, and, and cub survival and find out you know, what, what type of relationship might there be because um, it's possible that cubs are more vulnerable to mortality um, and getting killed by adult males, for example, in areas where, where densities of bears are, are greater. And that's certainly something that, that other studies have documented. This has been documented in Alaska and Scandinavia where uh, younger age classes simply become much more vulnerable to mortality because there's so many bears running around, including adult males that sometimes have a tendency to, to kill younger individuals, with cubs uh, being particularly vulnerable to that. So we, in fact, uh, looked at that scientifically in, in an analysis we uh, recently completed. And so you see this time frame of basically three decades, and cub survival was, was, uh, was, was pretty uh, level for the longest time, and then it started kind of leveling off uh, in the last decade or so. But there's not much leveling off there under this density index. But if you increase the density in this analysis, so if the density becomes higher, then you see a stronger effect. You see less survival of cubs. And then when you make that, when that density is even higher, where, where, what we're seeing in places like Lamar and Hayden Valley, for example, um, in those places, cub survival is really dropped enough to change the population growth to the point of what we're seeing right now, about zero to two percent, uh, as opposed to four to seven percent in the earlier decades. So we know that that, that is a, a potential driving factor behind this. And to us, that is an indication that we're reaching this, this, you know, what we, this ecological concept of carrying capacity, where the, the ecosystem really cannot hold many more grizzly bears. Um, and, and what you see is as the population grows, you start seeing a slowing of population growth once, you, once that population reached that magical carrying capacity line. And that is not, that is not the same every year. That, that varies over time, and it's, it's kind of difficult to define what that level really is. But that's, we're seeing a lot of effects of, of reaching carrying capacity in this population. Now, You've probably also heard of, of a lot of changes in terms of uh, food supplies for, for grizzly bears in this ecosystem. And, uh, and we specifically looked at that as well to see if that could have been responsible for that, that slowing of population growth. And in all our research, uh, we really didn't find that relationship. Um, so what I'll do now is kind of um, go through the, the different responses that we've seen uh, among grizzly bears to changing food resources. And there have been substantial changes in this ecosystem. But as you'll see at the end, um, bears have, have shown a remarkable uh, ability to adapt to that. First of all, seasonal diets of bears are, are, are pretty remarkable. Um, here's just a, a kind of a broad overview of what bears eat during different times of the year. And as you can see, it's pretty much whatever is available at the time. Um, and that means that grasses and sedges and forbs, you know, the, the leaves of plants and, and things like that are, are consumed almost year round. Um, but then when you get more specific to things like uh, elk rut, you know, elk become more vulnerable to mortality. And uh, bears either uh, eat carcasses of elk that have been killed in a rut or that are, uh, and, and or just predate on elk that, that become more vulnerable during the rut because they have other things to think about. And so you see very specific time periods for, for certain foods here. And it, it's very clear just by looking at this picture that, that bears respond to whatever are uh, valuable and, and, and readily available 
food resources. There's also the issue of you know what what food resource gives you the, the best bang for the buck, right? Um, you want you want to make your fee, your foraging uh, efficient. And if you look at these numbers, this is the, this is the caloric value, so the, the, the kilocalories that you get out of each gram of, of each particular food. I doubt that many of you would have thought that army cutworm moths would be at the top of this list, but they are. They just gram for gram, they provide the most kilocalories. And I'll show you some, some video of that in a little bit, uh, how bears forage on that, on that resource. It's pretty amazing. So these, these kind of highlighted here are kind of the high calorie food resources that bears have available. And uh, we'll just kind of go through those different food sources. I, I won't cover white clover though. There's, there's nothing real exciting to show about that. So white buck pine seeds are, are really important to, to grizzly bears in, in the fall season. That's the, the period that we refer to as hyperphagia. That's the, the time period that bears is, all they do is eat almost day and night. Um, and they're looking for these, these high calorie food resources to get ready for hibernation. And these, um, these nuts of white buck pine are really rich in proteins and fats, so they're, they're really a, a great resource uh, for grizzly bears. And this is how they forage on them. They actually take advantage of the work that the red squirrels do. The squirrels will actually cache the seeds, they make these, these big middens, and bears just, grizzly bears come along and, and just harvest that. You know, why, why make it more difficult if it's, if it's not necessary? So, they will, uh, they will consume tons and tons of these seeds that, uh, that have already been harvested by, by red squirrels. You can see some of the, the seeds laying there. In terms of, of the movements that these animals show to different resources, it, it's really interesting. You know, so we have, you know, we're using the latest technologies, GPS radio calls that, uh, that communicate with satellites so we can basically sit at our computer and get data of you know, what was this bear doing last night. And this is, uh, the, these are some movements from a, a bear that was uh, in the high elevation areas where whitebuck pine grows, but it was showing some exploratory movements. So you, you, you kind of follow the, the track of this individual uh, from dot to dot. The green is the whitebuck pine um, stands. So th this, this is, these are the stands where, where bears will be harvesting those seeds. And you can kind of see it's, it's hanging around on the edges of the white buck pine, but it's really not concentrating on, on anything. Then we go to early uh, September, and suddenly that pattern just completely changes. I mean, look how much different this is. This is totally concentrated on two different stands of white buck pine. All those locations in a two week time period, just, just in those two stands. So it's obviously harvesting those seeds in those areas, and that movement is very different from, from the previous slide. Now, most of you are probably aware of, of the fact that, uh, that white buck pine has shown a tremendous decline in this ecosystem based on, uh, based on some of our surveys that we do annually. Um, we've estimated that about 75% of, of uh, cone producing trees, so the older age classes, um, are, are now dead. And that's basically happened in, in about a 10, 15 year time period. So most of that is, is actually from um, a, a pest called the mountain pine beetle, a native pest. Um, there's some other factors like fire and, uh, and blister rust that, that also have affected the mortality of, of white buck pine as well. But it's, it's mostly been this, this mountain pine beetle. It's, it's really wiped out um, tremendous areas. And, uh, and, and we have seen a response of that from, from grizzly bears. We have seen the grizzly bears are using white buck pine habitats less than they used to. Um, so if you look at this, this is uh, the, the time trend basically from uh, about 2000 on, this, this white buck pine, uh, the mountain pine beetle epidemic uh, started in, in the early 2000s. And this is an index of, of, white, of, of selection by grizzly bears of white buck pine habitat. And, and this index, if it's 0.5, it basically means that, that they're using the habitat in the same proportion that's available, that they're really not selecting for it. So in the early uh, part of this decade, they, they were selecting for it, but it's been gradually going down where they're not selecting for that habitat. So they're responding to it. We've also seen that they're using this habitat type less than before. 
and they start using it uh, later in the year. So there's definitely been a response. So the question that comes to mind is, you know, how are they, how are they compensating for that? And we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a moment. I did not know there was sound with this. But, um, another, another species that, um, that has shown a tremendous decline is uh, Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Um, a lot of that has been the result of the introduction of, of an exotic trout, uh, lake trout, that, that uh, predate on, on cutthroat trout. So we've seen a tremendous decline in, in that resource, um, where up until you know, the early 2000s, we had lots of grizzly bear use of, uh, and, and consumption of, of cutthroat trout uh, in these tributary streams to Yellowstone Lake and in these, these yellowish areas. Uh, we've now seen basically a 63% decline of, of the number of grizzly bears using that resource. Now this is a very localized resource. It's really only around um, Yellowstone Lake area. And so the question there too is, you know, what, what alternatives are, are these bears turning to to, to get that particular, uh, to, to make up for the loss of, of that particular resource? Then there is the, the army cutworm moss. Um, which, which I find to be one of the, the, the most amazing um, resources that, that bears are, are using and, and taking advantage of. These occur at, at very high elevations, typically about 10,000 to 13,000 feet. So um, the, our cooperating agencies do, do surveys in these areas looking for bears uh, feeding on a moss. And this is um, typically what they see. At, each, at the end of each arrow is a bear feeding on these army cutworm moths on these big talus slopes where the, where the moths actually uh, stay during the, during the day basically for thermal refugia. They feed at night on uh, flowers in alpine meadows nearby. And this is what, uh, what bears do uh, basically all morning long. They um, very windy in those places and, um, and they just dig in the rock looking for those army cutworm moths. They can consume about 40,000 of those moths in a single day. 40,000. And um, so when you look at, at the calorie that, that these moths provide, at the, you know, the per gram, uh, that's an incredible resource. They can basically, in a couple of months, they can consume um, as, as many calories from that resource as a, as a, uh, that a bear would, another bear in any other part of the ecosystem would, uh, would take an entire year to do so. So it's a very efficient resource. And what we've seen is that we first discovered this, the use of this resource actually in 1986. So it's actually a relatively recent discovery. And what we've seen is an increase of the number of bears feeding on these, these army cutworm moths, and also an increase in the number of sites. We're now at 31 confirmed sites. Um, most of those are on the, on the eastern portion of the ecosystem, on the eastern portion of east of, of Yellowstone National Park. So we've seen a pretty steady increase in this, and it's just in this last year that we've seen a little bit of a drop. And uh, we don't really understand enough about this particular resource to, to explain why there was less use uh, of army cutworm moths last year. And then, of course, predation and scavenging is an important foraging activity for, for grizzly bears. They're well equipped to, to do so, and they're very effective predators. And, uh, and of course, we have a lot of ungulates in this ecosystem. And this is where you see, you know, I said earlier that, that grizzly bears are primarily solitary, which, which is, is true most of the time, but at these carcass sites is where we see some really interesting interactions. So um, this is in Pelican Valley, you see a bear sitting on a, on a carcass there, and then two other ones kind of looking for an opportunity to, to sneak in there and, and get a little bit of the action as well. Now pilots you know, catch some incredible scenes of, of grizzly bears pursuing uh, prey. And uh, in this case, I think this was an unsuccessful hunt, but we've seen plenty of evidence of bears killing a, a large bull elk like this, um, especially after they chase them into the water. Uh, we see that um, fairly, fairly regularly. And it's these, um, again, at, at these carcass sites is where you get a, a, a lot of interactions and uh, where, you, where you start seeing this, this kind of dominance hierarchy that develops among bears. And obviously, um, this bear was able to, to chase the other bear off and um, 
and there's some you know, back and forth checking um, you know, who's you know, who's bigger here, and and, and then there's a lot of interactions like that, uh, which are really intriguing to to witness. Well, this guy is obviously the the winner here, and uh, he's the loser taken off. This is a photo from uh, Hayden Valley um, from a number of years ago. You only see a few bears that are actually in this, in this picture around this large uh, bison carcass. And there were a total of 20 bears at one time. Um, so the attraction to the a resource like this is, is, is amazing. And in fact, based on our GPS data, we've seen uh, movements of about 10 miles in a straight line with a, a bear just picking up a scent of a carcass and just going 10 mile straight line to that carcass. So it tells you something about their, their, their sense of, of smell that they have. It's pretty incredible. What you see mostly here is males looking, looking to get a little bit of that, the, whatever is left on that carcass. Uh, females with offspring are pretty vulnerable in these situations. So they tend to be the ones, if they're there at all, they tend to be the ones kind of on the outskirts and really have to wait for a, a unique opportunity to kind of quickly sneak in there without endangering their offspring. This is very typical of what a big male will do. They, they get on a carcass. Uh, it could be a wounding loss from an elk hunt. It could be an animal that they killed or just a, another carcass that they found and just pile a bunch of dirt on top of it. And a lot of times these, they will just stay on top of it uh, and guard their carcass, basically. Now, you may be wondering, what is this barbed wire doing there? That's not keeping the bear in, obviously. Um, we're, we're using that, and I'll, I'll show you some, um, some video of that in, in a moment as well. We're, uh, we're using that for study in Grand Teton National Park, where we're looking at hunter-bear interactions. And, and so we put uh, barbed wire around a side like this to collect hair samples from the bears that are visiting uh, a carcass like this, that so we can, uh, with the genetics we, that we get from, from the hair, uh, the DNA we can get from a hair root, we can then determine which bears and how many different bears are, are visiting provides us uh, with a lot of neat insights. So let's look at a couple more um, maps of, of GPS locations of, of bears that, that indicate carcass use. Um, so now with this, with this technology of GPS and getting um, a location of a bear just about every hour and a half to two hours, we can really start looking at um, you know, what's, what, what they're doing. And, um, if we start seeing clusters of locations, we can now identify whether that is a use of a carcass or whether that's just a day bed. We can identify because there's a, these colors in yellow mean there's less activity associated, less movement associated with, with these locations. And we can tell that because there's a, a device inside the radio collar that will tell us movement of, of the bear itself. So if it's just laying down, there's not much movement. If it's feeding actively on a carcass, you see that in the, in the darker reddish colors here. And so that's how we can separate a carcass site. Even though we've never been there, we can tell that this is a carcass and this is a day bed. So this may be a bear that was actually pushed off the carcass by another bear that we were not monitoring. And he just stayed in a day bed until he was doing to compensate for the loss of all these, these food resources, especially whitebuck pine and at least localized cutthroat trout. And this is one way that, that they're doing it. They're shifting their diets to other resources, and they're shifting it in the fall, at least. This is um, uh, carcass use in the fall, in, in September, October. What we're seeing is an increase in, in carcass visitation rates. So they're making more use of carcasses. They're, they're basically compensating for the loss in years of, 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 white, of low whitebuck pine crops or in areas where whitebuck pine has died because of mountain pine beetle, they are switching to more meat in their diet and seem to have no problem um, with doing so. And then finally, another important resource for, for grizzly bears is the ubiquitous resources of plants, roots, and small mammals. They're basically anywhere in the ecosystem. So there's lots of opportunities for bears to, um, to find these resources, and they're well equipped to do so. They do a lot of digging. Uh, they're incredibly good diggers, as you can see with, when you have uh, two inch or, or bigger claws, you know, you, you, can, you can do that. And so this uh, video 
courtesy of Bob Landis, by the way, I should recognize that. Um, shows you some of the, the, the types of activities that bears do when they're, the, they're feeding on these different resources. In this case, it's actually um, a small rodent that this bear caught in this rotten log. Uh, typically, when bears are tearing up rotten logs, it's, it's for ant and, and ant pupae. And in this case, it's probably a pocket gopher or something like that, and you would try to basically jump on it. And the cubs are right in there um, to, to learn what they need to do. So by looking at and monitoring body condition over time, um, that means uh, looking at, at, at body weight, but also percent body fat, um, just like a, you, we can measure that in humans pretty easily these days. Uh, we use uh, what is called bioimpedance to, to measure percent body fat among bears. We were able to establish that, that there has really been no change in, um, in body fat among grizzly bears over time. You know, this is what a grizzly bear wants to be by, uh, by the beginning of hibernation, just fat, right? And, and I've seen a lot of bears that are fat and ugly. This, this bear is fat and pretty, I think. You know, it's, got, <laughs> it's, it's got a nice rotund shape to it. It's, it's, it's perfect. This is what, what bears want to be. And so we have looked at the rate of, of increase over the active season um, of percent body fat for two time periods, one before whitebuck pine decline and one during the peak of whitebuck pine decline. If whitebuck pine decline really was affecting uh, the nutrition and nutritional ecology of this species, you would see, you know, so the bears during the active season increase percent body fat because by the time they start hibernating in late fall, uh, they better be ready and have lots of body fat uh, typically about 25% more of body fat to survive the winter time. So if there was an effect from the loss of white buck pine, we would expect this line to, to not have a slope like this, the, the rate of increase in body fat. We would expect it to be flat or maybe even declining in this period of peak white buck pine decline. And we didn't see that. The increase was still, they're still gaining the same uh, the rate of gaining fat over the active season is still about the same as it was before. So they're finding other resources, and as I've shown you uh, previously, we, we see that some of those alternative resources are increasing the amount of, of animal matter uh, in the diet. And by the way, animal matter can include things like ants too. Um, ants are everywhere, and there, I'm not aware of any brown bear population where there's uh, not some component of ants in the diet. So ants can actually be more valuable than, than we've, we've thought before. And some of the increase in meat consumption or animal matter consumption may actually not just be ungulates, but also include sources like uh, ants and, and other insects. So we are really talking, uh, from, from our recent research, uh, uh, we're talking about an incredibly opportunistic omnivore uh, that can really take advantage of just about any resource that is out there and adjust its diet accordingly. And in fact, based on some of our recent studies, um, we've documented that bears consume in this ecosystem uh, have been known to consume more than 266 different food resources. This is based on, on uh, studies that go back 140 years um, that, have, that have been done within the, the Radio Yellowstone ecosystem. So that includes everything from, from berries to insects to ungulates uh, to roots of different plants, pocket gophers and, and various small mammals, you name it. And in fact, what, what our research is really showing is that the, the, the diets of grizzly bears are incredibly value, variable by day. They literally change their diet from day to day, a single individual. They, we know that, that they change their diets from season to season, whatever is seasonally available. We also know that individual bears have very different diets and very different preferences. And we also know that location uh, can, can make a very uh, variable diet. So a bear that lives in this portion of the ecosystem uh, might have this uh, white buck pine available to it. Uh, that's the, the grayish area in the background. Uh, and maybe uh, ungulate, uh, elk, elk herds in this case. 
Whereas a bear in, in another portion of the ecosystem may have also uh, army cutworm moths available. So depending on where you are in the ecosystem, your feeding economy is, is going to be very different. Um, and it's going to be driven by whatever is out there. And given the, f the fact that our ecosystem is so large, you'll see lots of variation in that. And that's, uh, that's, that's what we're seeing in, in our data. And a, a tremendous, um, tremendously dynamic system. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, genetic monitoring. Um, because genetics of a population can, can tell you a lot about the, the overall health of the population. And as I mentioned previously, we, we, we sample um, genetically by, typically by a setup like this with a, a single barbed wire where a bear climbs under, leaves a tuft of hair on the barbed wire. There is a, a, a um, not a bait, but a lure, a blood lure in the, in the center so that the bear is attracted to it. Uh, but we don't want to give it a reward with a bait, so it's, it's just a lure. And it's checking that out, but, but it's already left uh, the hair sample right here on, on the barbed wire. So this has been an incredibly effective system for uh, collecting genetic information on, on uh, wildlife populations. And it actually, this, this whole technique was developed for uh, with, with brown bears in, in Canada. So we, uh, we collect the, the hair, and uh, this is the, the root of a hair that contains the DNA that we set, sent to a, a lab in, in Canada that, that analyzes it. And that's how we can recognize different individuals. But we can also learn a lot of other things uh, from that. We can look at relationships among individuals. So we can look at parentage, for example, who is, uh, who is related to who, uh, siblings. Uh, we can look at relationships with other populations and such. So we learn a lot from, from this type of, of data collection. And this is uh, basically just for, for your entertainment, but um, sometimes we can collect hair samples even from utility poles. So all we do is, is put a, a small strand of barbed wire right on, on where they tend to rub. And uh, as you can see, it's a very effective way of, of getting uh, samples. And then these two um, cubs or yearlings, you know, it's like synchronized swimming. They. Uh, <laughs> They've, they've got it down, and, and as you'll see, they'll even come down at the same time and then rub the, the other side. And this is, uh, this is choreographed. He just had an extra itch, I guess. So why is genetics so important for the Yellowstone population in particular? Well, it is the most certain population in the lower 48s, and it is an isolated population. So any isolated population will ge lose genetic diversity over time. And if that lasts for a long time, that, that can affect uh, the health of a population. So we were very interested in, in sorting that out and, and seeing, is, do we see a, a, a change in genetic diversity of this population? First of all, if you look at this, 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 this thing called heterozygosity just basically is a measure of, of genetic diversity. And as you can see, there's a bunch of populations on, on, the, on, on this graph here, but uh, Yellowstone is pretty low, one of the, the, one of the lowest. The only population that is a little bit lower than Yellowstone in terms of genetic diversity is the, the certain portion of the cell curves. So yes, this is an issue. Genetic diversity is relatively low, even though there are populations that are way lower than Yellowstone. The, the ABC Islands in, in Alaska, for example, have much lower genetic diversity without any evidence of, of health effects on those populations. What we also know is that, that, uh, that uh, Yellowstone still remains uh, genetically isolated from, uh, from the nearest population, a certain portion of the, 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 uh, certain, you know, the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. Um, this is a technique, a statistical technique, with, based on the genetic data that, that separates clusters of, of observations uh, based on the genetics. And it clearly shows that the Yellowstone population, all these pluses here, are completely separate still from any other population. So we have not documented any movements uh, between Yellowstone and the Northern Continental Divide or, or the Cabinet Jack or the Selkirk uh, populations for that matter. This is probably one of the most scenic mating pictures I've ever seen of a, of, of a pair of bears. Um, 
thanks to, to Jake Davis, um, who has uh, been very graceful in letting us use his, his uh, great photos. Uh, he's a photographer out of Jackson. One thing that we really wanted to look at was something called uh, a genetically effective population size. And this is something we just recently published. And what that means is a, a, an effective population size means um, that the size of the population that contributes genes and genetic material to the next uh, generations. And, and that is always lower than the actual population size because not everybody contributes. Younger animals don't mate, so they don't contribute genetic material. Um, and then not all males get into the action. You know, some males will, may not get a chance to mate simply because they're outcompeted by, by bigger males. So what we, wanted to, what we wanted to know was, has the, the genetically effective population size increased over time? And has that increase been similar to the increase in, in the actual population size that we've seen? And, and where is that level of the genetically effective population size? Because there is some, this number of, this kind of a, a magic number of 500 uh, individuals of a, a genetically effective population that was established back in the 80s for, uh, based on, on some genetic studies based on other individuals. But, but this is kind of the, uh, the holy grail for, for a genetic management. This is where you want your populations to be for long-term viability. And what you see here in the green line is that effective genetically effective population size of the Yellowstone grizzly bear population. And what we see is that it started pretty low. This, this number of 50, you don't want to be below that for sure. That's, that's, a, that's a number that, that is another threshold on, on the bottom end. Um, so we, we started pretty low, but over the years, that number has increased to a point where we can now be very comfortable and confident that genetically, this population is, is going to be okay because we now have enough numbers in that genetically effective population size uh, to guard for any, any eventualities in, in the future that, that might affect uh, population levels. And what is really encouraging is that this, the pattern of increase basically is the same as what we've documented for the actual population, for our, our population estimates. So there's lots of encouraging news in, in, this, uh, in this slide. We've also uh, seen that there is no decrease of genetic diversity. Um, which without input from any other ecosystem, that, that is pretty remarkable. And the only reason that that is the case is that the population has been able to, to increase and grow over time. So by all means, regardless of, of the, um, the legal status of this population, um, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard discussions about delisting and, and such. Uh, regardless of all those discussions, what and deliberations that are still ongoing, um, from, a, from a scientific standpoint, the conclusion by all means is that this is a conservation success story. Uh, we have seen a tremendous recovery of this population and at levels where we're seeing that we're reaching carrying capacity, which is an indicator that you really can't grow this population a whole lot more, where we've almost occupied all suitable habitat. There's still some ability for expansion, maybe in, in the Wind River Range, for example, uh, maybe a little bit in a Wyoming range, but then you'll have more conflicts with, with uh, sheep grazing, for example. Uh, but by all means, uh, we're, we're starting to reach that level of carrying capacity throughout much of the ecosystem. And we're genetically in really good shape. So by all means, this is a, a conservation success story. And why, I think it's really important for us to think about why this is a conservation success. Because this has not been the case for many other populations uh, in other parts of the world. First of all, what we have here in this ecosystem is organization and people to manage. That's really critical. And we have the agencies, the state agencies, the, the federal and tribal partners that have worked collaboratively uh, for a long time and have made substantial commitments to making this a success story. Then we have the biological data. Um, the grizzly bear, integrated grizzly bear study team was a, a major contributing to factor to that from, right from the beginning. We've also seen a lot of political support um, because this is an iconic species in an iconic ecosystem. And especially in the early years, you know, politicians in, in the region uh, did not want the, the grizzly bear in Yellowstone ecosystem to disappear on their watch. So there was a lot of political support. 
And then, of course, the support from the public, I think, which uh, has been key to, the, probably the, the biggest key to all this. And, and that is, uh, you know, we've had a lot of public involvement. Uh, not everyone agrees, but that's okay. Um, there's been a lot of ability for the public to, to um, provide their input and to be heard. And I think that's, that's made this, this recovery program uh, more successful. And of course, for the agencies and, and for everyone involved, this, this is a balancing act. Um, people, people have different views about grizzly bears. And again, like I said, that, that is okay. Um, but it, it really is a, a balancing act. And um, I think the agencies in, involved um, with all this have, have really done a remarkable job. But there will be next challenges, of course. And one of those challenges is, is livestock depredations. As we see bears expanding into new areas, um, they're expanding into places where people might not have seen bears, grizzly bears, for in, in 100 years. So they're not used to it. And, and it takes time to adjust to that. That's, that's, that's only understandable. So we've, uh, this past year, for example, we've seen quite a few livestock depredations. Those, as long as we have grizzly bears on the landscape and as long as we have livestock uh, grazing, those are gonna be conflicts that, that will be very challenging to manage. We've also seen a fair number of hunter bear conflicts. Um, again, bears are, are really key in on, on that resource. So if you have a, 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 a wounding kill or if you have a, a carcass or a gut pile after a successful hunt, bears will, will key in on that. And, um, and there's been a number of situations where that puts uh, grizzly bears and hunters in, in an awkward situation. And uh, you know the majority of those end up on the fine, but we have a, a few incidents, incidents every year where, where people get injured uh, and or bear, uh, bears uh, get injured or, or killed. So um, those, are, those are difficult conflicts to, to manage. And of course, maintaining public support is, uh, is key uh, and, and will be really part of the next challenge as this population is still expanding and, and still increasing in, in some areas. So um, that maintaining public support is, is really the key and, and the bottom line for successful uh, grizzly bear management. And with that, I thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, I'll end up here with um, a video of a couple of rambunctious cubs that are always entertaining. Um, but at, uh, at this point, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. So what I'll, I'll t yes, I, I didn't mention that. Um, that's that's. We did look at whether it was possible that the, the lower cub survival that we've seen, you know, it started kind of in the early 2000s. Wolves were reintroduced in 1995, so it didn't really, in terms of population size, didn't get up um, and, and, and really until the early 2000s. So we did investigate whether wolves might have been driving the lower survival of cubs and that they were killing grizzly bear cubs. And uh, we could only document four instances where we've known of Bulls killing grizzly bear cubs. So, we, uh, if you look at the big, big scheme of things, that, that could not explain why we've seen that ecosystem wide. So, it is not the, in that sense, it's 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 not the the reintroduction of bulls. In fact, there may have been some benefits to bears because any, uh, you know, bears are very good at usurping kills from wolves. You know, a wolves is, is no a wolf is not a, a even a, a wolf pack is not a match to to a big grizzly bear. So. Uh, they might have actually, in a way, benefited from, from bulls a little bit. Of course, the downside of that is that bulls have also affected elk populations. So, um, you know, how that, how that comes out on balance, we, we really don't know. Yes? 
Yeah, so that, that, um, just to repeat the, the question, um, there's efforts and, and a lot of interest right now in potentially connecting, you know, the, the one step would be Yellowstone with, with uh, the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. And given the, the genetic status that I just showed, you know, that, that, that there's really not a lot of concern about the Yellowstone population genetically at this point, would that invalidate those efforts? And, and my, my answer would be uh, probably not. Um, but there's two components to that. So if this grizzly bear population in the Yellowstone ecosystem remains isolated in the foreseeable future, I don't see any concerns genetically. They, they, it's not a big deal right now. Um, if it became a concern, it, it, it could be managed by moving several individuals from another ecosystem into the Yellowstone ecosystem. If those individuals breed, you get enough new influx of genetic material where you can kind of uh, remove the, the, the effects of, of losing genetic diversity over time. On the other hand, it, I think it is desirable uh, to have connectivity if, if that is feasible. Um, it, it, it certainly it helps you guard for the long, long term um, conservation of, of the populations. And, not, and that goes both ways. You know, there might be some benefit to the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, even though it's connected to uh, populations in Canada. There might be some benefits to ultimately getting some uh, influx, genetic influx from, from the Yellowstone ecosystem. So um, I, think, I think it does not, to, to me, it does not invalidate those efforts. I think those efforts remain important, not just for grizzly bears, for a lot of other species uh, as well, of course. Um, but you know, obviously grizzly bears and wolverines are, are big, you know, iconic species for, for those efforts. Does that, does that qu answer your question? Yes? Yes, we have. And, um, and we are working on, on um, some projects right now to, to look at that in more detail. Uh, but we've, for example, we've, we've um, so we're looking at, at genetic trees and, um, and have documented uh, cub adoptions, for example, um, from what look like our related females. So uh, it's an indication to us that there's a lot more interactions going on uh, among family groups than, than we previously knew about. But now with the genetic information, we actually, we can actually document that. So we have, we've, we've uh, documented several um, cub adoptions from, from different uh, and switching of cubs basically between family groups. They apparently don't count too well. That's, uh, they have <laughs> Let's see, I think you had a question earlier. Yes, so that's, that kind of delves and starts heading into the policy direction. And, and as a researcher, I, I try my best to stay out of policy. And <laughs> um, what I can say, I think, is that, that in terms of any um, discretionary mortality that, that would be available for, uh, for a hunting season, uh, we will be talking about small numbers. I don't know if that answers your, your partially answers your question, but Well, I mean, I, I can, uh, so how does, how does states and the Fish and Wildlife Service work that out? At this point, I, I don't know, and, and that's really, that's a policy decision, so that's up to the states uh, to, to, to figure out. What I can say is that we currently um, estimate that um, a 7.6% mortality for females that are two years or older is sustainable to keep the population at the current level. And that's about 15% for, for males. So 7.6% for females, you know, we, we typically 
females can um, cannot support the same level of mortality that males can. There, females are the contributing factor to reproduction. Of course, males just breed and, and don't do anything else. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking about humans, but <laughs> but but it's the, so it's the 7.6 percent is is what our current estimate is for a sustainable mortality among females two years or older that would basically sustain the population at the, at the current level at that zero to two percent growth. So that's, um, that, that at least in, in terms of the, the actual numbers that, um, that we would be working with, it, it, it would be that. Well, you know, that, that's that's an interesting question. Um, you know, how how easy is it to catch those moths? Basically, even even though it's they're they're using those those talus slopes, those scree slopes as thermal refugia, um, they're not easy to catch. You know, they're, they're bears, you, you can see that it takes some effort to, to catch them because um, they you know they kind of go after them and and, and, and try to catch them. So. Uh, it's not like they're, they're all just half dead laying there and to be lapped up by, by a big bear. No, it's, it's, it takes a little bit of effort, actually. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, you know, that, that is really interesting because we, we keep getting reports of, of people seeing bears on those type of scree slopes. I mean, those type of habitats occur in other places of the ecosystem. But up, up to this point, we have not documented that those are actually aggregation sites of moths. So we have not documented, other than the eastern portion of the ecosystem, uh, almost all the sites are in Wyoming. Uh, in fact, I think all the sites are in Wyoming. Um, we, we just haven't seen it in, in other places of the ecosystem yet. So we, we had a report um, last fall f um, from an area um, in the Taylor's Fork region of, uh, on, on the western side. So we're, we probably investigate that this summer, but, but my guess is that that might not have been uh, army cutworm moths that they're feeding on. Sometimes they also, uh, we also see aggregations of, um, uh, of just ladybugs, and, uh, and bears will feed on those as well, actually. Yes? So the, the, how does I think uh, Wyoming uh, has a compensation program? I don't. Idaho does not yet. Okay. No, no, 
if there's, oh, one more question in, in the back. Well, the, 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 that, that's, that's a very good question. And, um, and what we anticipate is, uh, first of all, there, there's still a few areas where densities can, can probably increase over time uh, if, if they're allowed to, to increase. Um, what I anticipate is what, what you typically see in populations that, that, that get to this point of, of basically reaching carry capacity of, of the ecosystem is that they overshoot a little bit. So the, 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 the population level gets a little bit too high and that it can't really support that. Uh, and then it, and it goes down a little bit and it goes under that level of carrying capacity and it goes up again. So it kind of oscillates from there on out is, is what we anticipate. Um, and you know, that's, this is, it's not easy to document these type of processes and, and the fact that we've been able to document that and, and to document this density effect on, on cub survival is, is pretty unique. You know, most, most studies can't do that because they're not long enough. We, we've got more than 30 years, you know, basically 40 years of data to look at. And, uh, and so I'm, as, a, as a scientist, I'm really interested in, in what we'll see in the, in, in the coming decade or so uh, and see if that indeed uh, our predictions in, in, indeed uh, happen. Good question, because I forgot to mention it on my slide. I'm glad you asked. Um, so our, our, uh, we, we have, as I mentioned before, we have several ways of estimating population. Our estimate for, for uh, 2015 is 717 bears, 717 bears. We know, however, that that is a conservative estimate. So we, we based on, on other techniques, that, that number, we know that that number uh, in reality is, is likely higher. Um, but that's that's the official estimate that we have as a study team. Yeah. So we've we've come a long ways from from several hundred bears in in the early 80s. And uh, one thing I hadn't mentioned either is that you know we, we had all that con all the controversies and, and and concerns about the populations in the 70s, and the population actually kept declining through the 70s and into the early 80s. It's not until the early 80s until some of the on the ground management changed. Um, that the population started uh, increasing again. So we've, we've really only seen the actual increase since, since 1983, and it was, nobody has an exact number, but it was down to at, at most a couple of hundred individuals, and, and so we were substantially above that. Yes, it's 50-50 um, right now. It didn't used to be that way, but, uh, but in, the, in the early 2000s, that started changing, and, and now we basically have an equal uh, sex ratio between males and females. Yeah. yeah, good, good question. Um, you know, we, we, our, our purpose is to, to keep monitoring. That that is an important task for us to so to keep doing what what we have been doing, um, whether the population is delisted or not. That that will continue uh, with the same intensity. And then we were pursuing um, various studies. As I mentioned, um, we are working on, on that uh, study in Grand Teton National Park right now, looking at, at uh, predicting hunter-bear interactions so that we can, uh, in the future, hopefully help hunters to, to prevent uh, situations where, where, they, where they run into bears. Um, we're also um, really interested in, in going more to um, in, in physiological monitoring. Um, with some of the newer devices that are used in wildlife science, you can use really small heart monitors that you can implant in, in animals. And we're hoping to get to a point where we can get information about that and see how bears are responding to, to various human activities. You know, um, what, you know, the, the Park Service uses a distance requirement of, of 100 meters uh, to, to stay away from, from bears. Um, you know, yeah. Do bears respond to bears? At, uh, do bears respond to people at 100 meters, or do they respond to them you know, only when you get to within 25 meters, or maybe 200? You know, those are the things that we can actually start monitoring now with this uh, with these newer technologies. So we are really interested in, in looking more at uh, into the, the physiological monitoring. Um, also, have a lot of interest in, in um, monitoring the physiology during hibernation, which uh, which is pretty challenging. You know, we Unlike black bears that we, we typically visit in the den while they're hibernating to change the radio collar and, 
and that can all be done safely with black bears. That is not the case with, with grizzly bears. Well, it probably would be the, the physiological monitoring in, in during hibernation. Uh, there's, there's actually a lot more uh, research coming out in the last five to ten years or so, um, but most of those have been done on the kind of experimental conditions in, in, with captive bears or um, bears that are taken, free-ranging bears that are taken and put in, into a certain facility. Um, I think we're, we're getting to the point where we might actually start doing that with free-ranging bears, and that, that would be really interesting to, to see what, you know, how, do, how do these bears physiologically adapt to, to a period of inactivity for, for six, five to six months? Um, and we know a lot about that already, you know, about the heart rate being lower and, and respiration being lower and how that, and why they don't suffer from diabetes and things like that. But there's, there's still lots of topics that, that we can investigate there. So that, that would be uh, one interest that as a, as a pet project that, that I would love to do that. Let's see, let's maybe take a couple more questions. I, I mean, I, I can talk for <laughs> all night, but, um, but I'm certainly going to be around so, uh, for a little while. So if you, if you want to ask a question after we're done, I'm more than happy to. Well, um, that's, I think what, what um, I'm not sure that preventing is, is the right word, that there is just um, what you need for a population to really expand um, is females. So any connectivity with another ecosystem, let me put it in, in, in those terms, any connectivity with another ecosystem, whether it's Selway Bitterroot or with uh, Northern Continental Divide, will require females to, to move beyond the boundaries where they are now. It, Males are not going to provide a connectivity demographically. They're, they're going to provide genetic connectivity. If you have a male move between two ecosystems, yes, they can, they can share genes and, and you, you have genetic connectivity. But we, as scientists, we make a difference between genetic connectivity and demographic connectivity. And demographic connectivity means female bears moving into a new area, co literally colonizing a new area, establishing a home range, and, and moving along. And because females don't disperse very far, you know, they stay very close to their natal home range. Female offspring don't, don't disperse very far. It takes a long time for bear populations to naturally uh, colonize new areas. So that is, together with some barriers, um, interstate highways, things like that, um, they, they, they restrict that movement. And that's, um, colleagues in, in, in Canada have, have shown that uh, very conclusively that that developed valleys with highways and, and housing uh, prevents that type of movement of, of young female bears establishing and colonizing a, a new area. So yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Okay, I'll be around, so if you, if you have any other questions, thank you. Frank, I, I have one word for you before everybody leaves here, and that's wow. Um, I've heard Frank speak many times, folks, but he really pulled out all the stops tonight.